Casual Magic has been sponsored by Quiver, maker of the Quiver and Bolt deck cases and other fine deck holding accessories. Use the code CASUAL on their website for 10% off your order. We're also sponsored by Architect, the premier site for hosting your decks on the internet. I love them and they love me and uh, it seems like a good reason for you to use them. You can also support Casual Magic directly by going to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Shivan B. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Casual Magic, the show where we talk about the fun side of magic together. My name is Shivan Button. Casual Magic is brought to you by Quiver Time and Architect and my patrons at patreon.com forward slash Shivan B. Uh, and today I am very excited because of uh, my guest is actually like gigantic in other spaces, which is always fun and interesting and different. Uh, but a lot of you have been like, oh man, you should totally talk to this guy. And I'm like, who is this? Uh, but um, <laughs> So it's really cool because I am talking today to uh, League of Legends and I don't know general purpose esports caster Medic, who is apparently gigantic in like places that I'm too old to pay attention to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is always I mean I always feel a little weird about that because like people are like you know him and I'm like yeah we played Magic in Amsterdam together it was awesome and um, then I realized oh wait like parasocially no I have no idea. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I mean, but that's half the fun of these because, like, yeah. I get to talk to a lot of people from a lot of different spaces and just learn about things because this is, like, close to my 250th episode, which means wow. that I have talked to a lot of different people and I've covered, like, a lot of magic people. So this year I've been trying to branch out and see, like, people play magic in other spheres. Let me talk mm -hmm. to them. So when, when I saw that you were uh, getting into magic and um, some of my friends were like, dude, dude, you got to talk to him. And I'm like, Wow, this guy seems really cool. Okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I'm really glad that we got to meet up in uh, in Amsterdam and hang out, even though that was literally the worst my deck has ever played. <laughs> I mean, it's not about how the deck plays, is it? It's no, about it's the, not. the company and the camaraderie, it's, right? I had a exactly great time. It's a lot of fun meeting you. Yeah, like, I mean, I was playing my Nero deck and literally played six turns and did not play a single card that game. <laughs> <It laughs> yeah, was that, so I was I, I, remembering the game now. It was pretty, it was pretty diabolically so, bad. But. It was phenomenally terrible. I mean, like, <laughs> I, you know, sometimes you just don't perform. Yeah, sometimes it happens, right? And you did keep, I remember when you kept the hand, you're like, I'm not going to do anything for five turns. Yeah, and then turns maybe out. I'll do something. So and then it the was game true. <laughs> <laughs> still though it was really lovely because normally in magic cons i don't get to play games like i go there and you know people are like oh man i want to meet you i want to talk to you whatever and so playing games at magic con is something that happens to me at like the hotels afterwards or you know privately and so but when you were like oh hey and i was like wait i promised you a game okay i'm gonna i'm going to change my normal way of doing this i'm gonna actually sit down and play games and because of that, I ended up playing more games at this Magic Con than I did literally ever previously. And it was still like fun. I was like, wow, maybe there is a way to balance this and I can actually just enjoy myself and not be like a jerk to fans or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I was super lucky because not many people know who I am right. in that space, right? So I just sat in the creator area and just played like 10 games a day <laughs> and had a, had a whale of a time. So yeah. it is very, it's very interesting when you have that balance because when I'm... If I'm at a league event, like ninety percent of the time I'm backstage, right? Just because like you're working or you have call times or you're getting lunch and meeting fans can be exhausting as yes. well. And so it, you kind of try and limit the time. And it sounds really bad. No, but, but like, you, I, I, I can deal with an hour of like social time with fans per day, and then the rest of the time I'm like, I can't do this. I need to be in working. my space. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, honestly, I can relate. <laughs> like, I know exactly what that feels like, and. Um, it's always fun when you're in a space which is not yours and you mm -hmm. could like, I went to Gen Con recently, which is like, you know, just a big board game convention. Yeah, there were magic players there, but I was not a featured celebrity or whatever. So me and my family, we could just hang out and be average fans and wait in line and do all the things. It was great. And I forgot how, like, because I've only been going to magic events for so long, I've forgotten what it was like to just be like, oh yeah, nobody's bothering me. That's kind of rad. Um, yeah. I'm like, how should I start this? Because like you're based in Berlin and you do yeah. a lot of League of Legends casting and a lot of like, is it is mainly League, right? 
Yeah, predominantly League. I have yeah. a couple of other games that I, I do a little bit of casting for, but those are like sporadic work. Like my main work for 10 months of the year is, is League of Legends. That's crazy. Because yeah. like every time I think about League of Legends, I'm like, man, when I was younger, I played Warcraft 3 and thought the hero units were the dumbest thing ever. And why would anybody want to play that? Next thing I know, Dota exists. Next thing I know, League exists. And suddenly I'm like, oh, well, I guess I was literally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like League is a really hard to get into game if you don't know what you're yeah. looking at. Um, but it's weird. My 10 year old son has come home and he started playing Pokemon Unite and he's teaching me about like MOBAs and things. I'm like, this is mm -hmm. not what I expected as a parent gamer, just being taught what this genre is. <laughs> um, but there's like two conflicting thoughts. I'm like, how did you get into League? But how did you get into Magic? So I actually want to start over first because I remember you said something sure. to me very interestingly when we were just meeting and passing, which is like, you lived in India for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. How did that come about? Uh, my dad's a missionary. So like we, we moved around a lot as a kid when I was a child to um, for him to work. Mm -hmm. So like, I was born in Birmingham. I moved to Denmark when I was two, moved to Norwich when I was five. Moved to India when I was 10 and then back to England when I was 18 for university. Because um, you I have lived a very in a place... clean British accent. So I'm like, how do you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, as, as someone that, you know, has been in and around India uh, throughout your life as well, I, like, there, there is still a big hangover and an understandable hangover around British colonialism, right? And it's understandable. I like 100% sure. understandable. But I got bullied a lot as, as, as a Brit Ooh, really? in India, right? Like, again... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, um, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying I understand. No, but it, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it makes sense, as yeah. you say. Um, and I think the deliberate, like, middle-class English accent was kind of a screw you <laughs> to the people <laughs> that were bullying me. I know that sounds just bad, but it was down, like, a, right? I'm just going to be British, right? Like, right. That, that, was my, that was my personality, my, my being was being British in India. Um, <laughs> and not in like, I didn't mean it in an offensive way. I didn't, I wasn't going around. Yeah, saying, you're not you know, like, hey, polish my boots, buddy. No, it's yeah, you. exactly, right? But it was, it was kind of like, uh, this is my roots, so I'm going to stick with them. Um, yeah, they are very interesting. I lived in a place called uh, Kodaikanal or Kodikanal, depending yeah. on how you pronounce it, in Tamil Nadu which is in the Western Ghats, so it's quite mountainous region. I, yeah. think, we were, I think I looked it up the other day, around 7,000 feet up or so. Yeah, and it's um, in the deep south too. Yeah, really really near really near the south. Yeah. Um, like we'd go to like Chennai and, mm. you know... Um, that's very cool. Madras, and, uh, Madras is Chennai, Madurai, yeah. that's the other place. Yeah. And then uh, near, near enough to Bangalore that you can call it near in Indian terms, yeah. but it's still like a 14-hour train journey <laughs> right. or something. It's like know. six days by bull cart, but yeah, it's pretty close by. Yeah, yeah pretty close, you know, it was fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it definitely, it defined a lot of my childhood. It's always weird to talk about because for me, that was just growing up. And sure. for other people, they're like, you've been all over the world, you've done all this stuff. And like, yeah, that's... That's just who I was. Yeah, right? like when I you're just 10, how... you're not thinking about, oh, look at this life. I'm, you're just like, yeah, exactly. I have to go to school and then come home and clean. And it's, like, it's yeah. his life. Um, I, I went to like a, an American private school, but it was, if you lived in Cody, you got like special dispensation to go sure. to the school. Um, but we had a lot of people from all over the world there. So yeah, it's like an of, international school type of thing. Yeah, a lot of Koreans, uh, a lot of people from Koreans? Like, the Middle East and stuff. Yeah, there was a huge amount of Koreans. I learned... The first swear words I ever learned were in <laughs> Korean because my dad, like, we didn't learn them as kids, right? My, you know, yeah, Christian no, family and all that. My first um, swear words were in Vietnamese and Korean for that same reason. My best friend's Korean. Yeah, exactly. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was very interesting. And then obviously, like, coming back to, to the UK for med school and such. But, but I, I do miss school? it from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. I went to what, what? university. I'm a doctor, technically. What the hell? Like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's where medic comes from. Ah. Um, I thought that yeah. was like your role in like Overwatch or something. <laughs> I mean, I, I do play support in League, but yeah, I uh -huh. um, I was originally called. There was a, a show called The Mighty Boosh, which is a UK comedy with Noel Fielding and another guy whose name I always forget. Um, and they do it, it's uh, it's like sketch comedy, -ish. but outlandish situations. Yeah, very wacky. And there's a character in it, and you can tell me if I'm not. I, I'm going to use the word crack fox. And you, you can tell me if that's like above, like not no, family friendly enough. That's yeah. Fine. yeah. Right. So there's a crack fox in the show. So I call myself the crack fox. Uh, and then <laughs> when I when I started working for Riot, they were like, huh, maybe you can't maybe call yourself that, that anymore. Oh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So I, sw I switched over to medic. Okay. Yeah. So 
so there's a story here, first off. Um, sure. Okay, so, well, what was it like growing up in India, though, just, like, by and large? Was it, like, it must have been, I mean, I guess you don't really have a lot of comparison because you were too young to, like, be like, oh, this is very different from British childhood yeah. or whatever. I think, like, I, looking back at it, it does seem like it was very different. Like, my, my school days and such were uh, like vastly different to what they have in the UK. So yeah. I'd be up at, like, 5 a.m., I'd go rowing on the lake, <laughs> I'd finish my school day at like 7 p.m. after doing drama for three hours after school. Right? Yeah. And it's like v very packed days. We also did the International Baccalaureate, which is mm. quite a demanding. Yeah, um, it's like honors program. Yeah. Um, but it was, yeah, it was very fun. And I did you learn I any think Tamil? It definitely. I, 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 I did in school, but it was one of those classes where mm. you had to learn Tamil for like two semesters. And obviously, no one really learned any right. Tamil. And you learn enough for with foods Hindi, right? or whatever. It's like, yeah, exactly. How do I, I go can to be the like bathroom? chalo or tike or like I can say, you know, very yeah. basic stuff. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, um, <laughs> um, yeah. So I learned some Tamil. And then I think it gave me a, quite a good understanding of like the disparity between lives because. It, it, the the comparison between someone that has to you know walk three miles to get water and trying to find that same disparity in the UK is, is quite different, right? So you're very, it's very obvious to you. Like you don't know level. what poverty is until you go to India, and then you're like, yeah. oh, there's like poverty, and then there's like destitute, and yeah. it's like, oh, this is beyond my comprehension. Tears of yeah, it. it it definitely gives you like a, a very crystallizing viewpoint of like the struggles that people go through. And I like, I don't know if you've ever flown into Mumbai, Yeah, but when you fly in over all of the slums, oh, yeah. it's just such an obvious, like my uncle actually uh, owned a Photoshop in Dharavi, the biggest slum in Mumbai. Oh really? So like when I was a kid, like for instance, I went to movie Slumdog Millionaire once and I was like, mm. Oh, if the camera literally turned around, you would see my uncle's shop. You know, it's like, <laughs> uh, it's, it's wild because like you see people living in like corrugated tin shacks or whatever, yeah. or just like three walls. They don't even have the fourth front door. Or and it's weird because like I come from a position of high privilege. Obviously, I'm an American, but my family was upper caste. My family was mm -hmm. well to do enough to be able to send both people to America, for God's sakes. And like you go back and it is like over here, we're kind of like middle class, lower middle class. But over there, we're like insane. And yeah. just the kinds of like privilege and stuff you don't really understand until you go back and you're like, this is, wow, uh, this is not okay. <laughs> yeah. It's just such a massive chasm, yeah. right? Like my, my dad's a missionary. He doesn't get paid a salary or anything. It's all charitable donations. And we were able to live a life of extravagance, but yeah. like go into five-star hotels and everything just because of the, the level yeah that is needed in, uh, and it, I think it has changed a little bit out in India, but there's still that massive yeah uh, massive disparities you i say. mean yeah and like there's been uplift but like there's a billion people you can't uplift a yeah. billion people but yeah. so how you you came back to the uk and decided to go to med school uh so i wanted to be a doctor since i was five hmm. um my mom was actually quite sick when i was growing up she had breast cancer um and uh when i came back to the uk i originally wanted to apply um from from high school immediately apply to uh, universities but i missed an exam deadline um, so I only applied to Oxford, got rejected from Oxford, uh, unsurprisingly. <laughs> like, I'm smart, but I'm not that smart. Yeah, we're not Oxford smart, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then I came back and did a year as a healthcare associate in a, a nursing home. So, you know, looking after elderly people um, when they can't look after themselves, sure. basically. And then during that year, I then applied to Norwich Medical School, which is where I ended up going to university, uh, too. So... Why are you casting League of Legends? <laughs> it's fun. Um, <laughs> that, look, that is the most reasonable answer you can give, right? Like, this yeah. is more fun than that is. I, it, I, I, we can get into it, and it, but it is it like I got very depressed being a doctor, and it, I'm like warning for anyone watching: this is not like easy stuff to talk about. Obviously, right? Sure. Uh, I'm, I, I'm quite an emotional person, and. I really struggled leaving the problems of patients at the door. Like I was living on site. It was very easy for me, like a five minute walk to get into a ward. Yeah. So often I'd be, you know, doing 80 to 100 hour weeks just because I could. Just yeah, because it's right there. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so I that disconnect was very hard for me to find. And after I cast a little bit in med school and retired from casting just before my finals exams uh, and I started doing it again, just 
like on my days off as something to do you know i still enjoyed league it was fun i was relatively good at casting um and got offered a job with a company called super evil megacore who made a game called vainglory i know i know <laughs> they made a game called vainglory which was an incredible game a really fun uh 3v3 moba uh mobile moba it was really good uh, it ended up not actually going anywhere long term but they offered me basically a doctor's salary for a year um working but like doctor salaries in the uk aren't massive right? okay. like I, I i went on strike during um <laughs> during my my uh, one year tenure. as a doctor as well and they've gone on strike again this year because it hasn't gone up in the last 24 years Jeez. um so yeah uh so yeah they offered me a, a contract saying hey we'll we'll give you these guaranteed days over the year do you want to come and do this and within about a week of being offered this contract, I was like, yeah, I, I think I'd just prefer to do that. Um, so ended up talking to my supervisor saying, hey, I'm not going to be not going to be going into my year two of uh, post university training. And uh, and yeah, started casting out of my spare room in my apartment. It's it's interesting you mentioned that because like in my other life, I'm a Hindu priest, right? Like I'm clergy. Yeah. So I know very well what it's like to have to deal with you know problems and like medical traumas and just like people on death's door and things and mm -hmm. it's very hard to let that go especially if you're an empathetic person if you're an emotional person yeah. and to deal with suffering is it's hard it's very hard and you need a lot of mental fortitude and we live in a culture where that's not where like you know caring for yourself is not something we do very well and, and it's not it's not promoted at all and like it, we, it wasn't something we really learned about in med school and i think if if i went back and had my current maturity as a doctor i think i'd still be a doctor if i was like where i am at 33 sure. at 24 because uh, i understand like how i deal with stress and how i can relieve stress and what i need to do in these moments and you know sometimes you prioritize work sometimes you prioritize right. self right um and I, it, yeah i think you and i are very similar in the fact that it's it's the giving Right, you yeah. want to be able to give as much right. as you can to make the people around you uh, happy yes, or have exactly a good experience. That. Right. That I mean, that's that is pretty much my entire driving force. Is like I want everybody around me to feel good, to be happy, or if I can help you in some way, or if I can make your life better. And then I feel deeply like depressed and sorrowful if I can't. If like somebody is sitting in my house and they're bored on the couch, I'm like, oh, and there's like. 85 other people who are having a great time at the party i feel like i've completely yep. washed this party and i've just like yeah <laughs> buffed it entirely i'm a failure as a man god hates me whatever and it's like no dude just they're having a moment to chill relax but like when when i'm in like a professional setting or something and someone's like i need you to come and you know administer the last rites to my like dying cousin or whatever and that's really i mean that's so hard because I want to make you feel comfortable and feel good, but I can't, I'm not in a position to actually do anything yeah. because I can't, because I'm not a doctor or you're in a situation where the least I can, the only thing I can do to make you comfortable and walking away from those with like, I mean, even if in less like deep life and death situations, it's like people come up to me in magic shows all the time. And they're like, man, I'm, you know, I live at home by myself and I don't have many friends. I'm super depressed all the time. Listening to your shows, you know, gives me comfort and joy and happiness. And I'm like, that's, I'm so glad I can do that for you. And I wish I could do more. Right. But yeah. like, I, I mean, what, what do you do? And that's part of why these events end up being so draining for me, because it's like, I want to give you the full, as much of me as I can, but sometimes you end up overextending and then it's like, yeah. okay, I need to, I need to eat. <laughs> so I'm best. Uh, yeah, it, it's exactly that problem. And I think some, like, as the years have gone on, I think maybe I isolate myself more at events. Yeah. Because I'm like, I can't give you, like, my full attention. Right. I have 15 minutes to walk through this venue. And I've, I've allocated 15 minutes of my day to make sure that I can say hi to a few people, right? Yeah. But I have 15 minutes to get from here to here. And if we stand here and talk for five minutes about why you think Rakan is a really good jungler, for example. Like, I want to have that conversation, right. but it's really difficult to actually give you a dedicated time when there's 10 people behind you who also want my time. This right? is why um, I don't play at Magic Cons, because if I sit down yeah. and I lock myself in a two-hour game with these three people, how many dozens of people am I not saying hi to? <laughs> right? Exactly. And, I think um, yeah. the, the idea of wanting to please people or make people happy is super interesting to me, because I... It, it went from 
when I was a doctor, I wanted to go into pediatric orthopedics, which is oh, children's bones, basically, right? Yeah. And uh, yes, it is like a very tough topic because you're dealing with children with, with illness, which is always going to be very hard. But also, a lot of the fixes are quite immediate. Yeah, bones heal. <laughs> exactly, right? And children's bones especially. Right. So, right? Like, children's bones will just bend. They won't even break a lot of the time. It's called green stick fractures. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, but you can fix it. And then you can send someone out and say, in two months, you're going to be able to walk. You're going to be able to do this thing. And I really struggled with more chronic illnesses. Oh, yeah. It always felt like, like, I can't make you happy. I can alleviate like the next four months for you. But after that, things are going to struggle. And I find it uh, to a degree in casting as well. It's very strange where I can, I can make an immediate good impression on someone. But if you make a few bad impressions on someone, that sticks around for a lot longer. Yeah. And it really hurts. Like, yeah. I can read a whole thread of people being like, oh, Medic did a really good job on this cast. Medic was so good. And then it's the one person's like, he can't pronounce R properly. I hate it. His accent sucks. He says Bowen instead of Baron. I'm like, oh, please. Oh, God, just dude. an English accent. But it's still <laughs> like, <laughs> Let me tell oh. you, man. Let me tell you what it's like to be the face of everything that is wrong with Magic for every random person. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yeah, you're on the Commander yeah. Rules Advisory. I'm on the, yeah, I'm yeah, on I, the advisory. Lots community. of tweets. Yeah. Lots of tweets recently. Oh, like, yeah. So. Let, let me tell you, buddy. The, in, in, there's an in-joke in the rules committee in the advisory group that I am the tank of the RC because I sit there and I go out and I draw all the fire. <laughs> and it's just like, and look, I've been through things like Gamergate. I've been through lots of weird internet things. I've been around for a very long time. So this doesn't really bug me because commander players, the worst they do is yell at you. And it's like, you're not dropping yeah. bombs in my house. It's fine. Go ahead. Yell all you want. But it's just like, after a while, it's like, dude, it's literally not my fault. Wizards <laughs> makes the cards. Why are you yelling at me? But it's like, they can't yell at wizard. Wizard doesn't care because it's a company. They can't yell at the rules committee because the rules committee doesn't respond to the thing. So they go like, okay, well, who who can I yell at? And here's the bottom yep. pipe. And it's like, hi, guys. <laughs> yeah, like, I get that a lot with Riot decisions as well. Right, I'm just yeah. like, I, I just want proactive communication. Please just say something to these people so they'll get off my butt. You know, I, just, <laughs> yeah, I know I'm the face of your company, but like, please. Yeah, I mean, you don't balance these things. You're, it's not yeah. your fault that this guy does no influence. two less DPS than it did last season or whatever. And they're like, how dare yeah. you ruin my my top <laughs> laner or whatever. Um, yeah. It took me a very long time to learn the vocabulary of League of Legends. Like, it is not. Like, I get top and I get bottom. I do not <laughs> get jungle. And I'm like, do you mean there's only one map and these guys are playing tens of thousands of hours on only one map? But then I, I, I figured it out eventually. Like some very okay. patient people <laughs> help me <laughs> understand. But I like I still don't understand though why there's only one map. Like wouldn't well, it be more? There only needs to be one map. The the inventiveness comes from the champions mm. rather than from the map. And I think one of the good things and one of the reasons League has stayed around so long is how many champions they made. Yeah, like, there's like hundreds of different, them. Yeah, 170 different picks. You have a lot of different play styles and even i think now people are realizing some of the champions are relatively similar and you know they do the same thing they still find ways to like innovate and invent um, and it's also like the combination of champions not just the yeah exactly right? Like, right like you can have a dive comp or you can have a poke comp or you can have mixed dive and poke and you have an enchanter or a tank and everyone can find something that they want to do and also like if you want to just play one champion over and over again, you can do that. Like, it's not always going to be a perfect pick. Like, I'm at the moment, I play a lot of Nautilus, who is a big guy with an anchor. Very cool. Like, he's in a full dive suit. I find him really fun. But there are certain picks that I'm like, if the enemy picks this, I'm kind of screwed. You know, I, I really can't do anything here. So yeah. I just ban it. You know, I just get rid of it. I'm like, cool. Now I can have my fun. <laughs> Excellent. Um, right. I forgot that you can yeah. ban like certain champions at the beginning. And that's sort of like sideboarding. Like, you're just preemptively yeah. saying, like, this thing that is going to be bad for my character, you don't get to play. I, it's like if in MTGA, I could say, I want a no prowess Q. I think, like, if I could do that, I'd be very happy. It would make, <laughs> me, make my Golgari mid rage a lot easier. Yeah, right? So tell me yeah. about it. Um, how did you get into League? Uh, my high, not high school, my university dorm mate. So in the first year, we were just in like dorms. Um, he told me that I should start playing it because it had just come out. It was about a year old at that point. And I had my Mac. And so I, is it Timebox? I can't remember that you can run Windows inside the Mac. I can't remember what it's called. But yeah, I did that, played games on like 20 FPS and enjoyed it. And then the next year I bought a PC and just started playing and yeah, it's one of those, I think um, a lot of people that got into League at the start were just, it was just a, it was a new game. Yeah. It was a big was new, a game, new game, right? From and a big all new my genre. friends played it. 
Yeah, exactly, right? Um, Why I wasn't really a Dota? gamer beforehand, though. Sorry? Why League instead of Dota? Uh, well, because no one told me about Dota. Fair. Fair. Yeah. I guess I walked into that one. <laughs> yeah, I I also think like I wasn't really a big gamer. My dad and I played like FIFA, Pro Evolution Soccer, some Tomb Raider, Toka Touring Cars when I was growing up, and then like League was the first game I was really introduced to. Um, so it was yeah, maybe I I just hyper fixated on that and I just made my entire career. I mean, look, dude, the, I'm playing the, Magic yeah. for a living. I know what that's like. <laughs> I learned this in eighth grade, so uh, it's a it's a long time to do this. Um. Yeah. But, like, you said you started casting in university? Yeah. Like, was Twitch around then, or were you on Justin TV or YouTube or something? Or No, it was Twitch. I think it might have just oh, changed from young. Justin TV. <laughs> but, like, when is this? This is 12, 13 years ago? I'm not sure. It might have been Justin. I'm pretty sure it was Twitch at the time. Um, but, yeah, I got a little drunk one night, and my friends were playing, and we had scrims. Like, it was, we had 11 people, so we did 5v5, and you can play, like, a custom, a sure. custom map. Um, and I was just like, well, I can just stream this and you guys can watch it and I'll just talk about you guys, right? <laughs> and so I did it and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I reached out to like volunteer stuff. There's a, there was a competition called Go For LOL, which happened every weekend. It was just like open qualifiers. You could cast it for free uh, and started doing that. And then got some notice by the Riot team in, in the UK and they started inviting me to like more regional events. Um, then I applied to work for Riot in my third year of medical school and they rejected me. They, like, they were like, no, can't believe, you're too How excited, dare. you have no, I mean, the, 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 the complaints were very valid. Like it was, <laughs> you have no, you have no top end control, you're too excited, you don't know enough about the game, all of that. It's like, yep, that's 100% right, 100% right. Um, but yeah, then I quit when I went into my final year of med school, because I was like, I've got to focus on my studies. Sure. I can't let, you know, traveling every weekend uh, uh, affect it. Med and then, school, and yeah. just try and do this during med school seems insane to me, given the workload of med school. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's so many people that do so many cool things in med school. And like, at, at I was university, an English like, major, man, I trust you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but like, I'm sure for you now, you have all of these extra cool things you do alongside all of the magic stuff. You do, yeah. Right. Like sure. right now I, I'm learning how to scuba dive. Right. And I feel like sometimes you just have this personality where it's a, I really enjoy getting very good at something yes. outside of my job. Right. And for a while it was my job. And now I've learned, you know, personal work separation <laughs> and trying not to be just hundred percent focused on my job the whole time. Yes. But yeah. I think I've always had that personality where even in high school, you know, I was a relatively good student. You um, just want to have relative... something to do all the time. Yeah. But I did drama and I did rowing and it, it's just, if I'm not progressing somewhere, I really struggle to feel like I'm productive. Like on, even on my days off, I really struggle with relaxing. Like how can I relax more productively? What can I be doing? <laughs> <laughs> that is the content creator's dilemma right there, man. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, that is hurts. our life's misery. It's like, <laughs> me and my friends and I could just be sitting there playing like, should we be taping this? No, no, yes. stop. Oh, stop. yes. yes. <laughs> I have that all the time with the with the LEC casters at the moment because we have about five of us that play Magic relatively regularly. Like two two of them are just getting into it and then Draco Stagger and I play really regularly. And every now and again, we'll have a funny moment at the table. We'll be like, guys, this could, this could be content. No, <laughs> you, no, no, it's no, like, no, no, no. I just want to enjoy myself. <laughs> You've got to keep something for yourself. Like, yeah. so I worked in the video games industry for a long time. That was what I did after college. And what I realized, and then I worked into the film industry, and what I realized is that if you're, if the thing that you like to go home to relax to is your job, you cannot relax. Because yeah. then you're going home and all you're seeing is more work or just like you're looking at a thing through the context of work. Like, for instance, I like video games a lot, but I'm kind of medium on films. When I was in the game industry, I had nowhere to relax because I don't want to go home and turn on a PlayStation after working at PlayStation all day. But... Yeah. Then when I was in the movie biz, I was like, I don't care about this stuff. So I can go home and read a book or play a video game and chill and be fine about it. And I discovered that like people are like, oh yeah, you should turn your passion into your job. I'm like, no, don't. It won't be your passion anymore. It won't be fun. Like I'm yeah. very good at baking and gardening and I could probably go to a flea, flea market and sell all this stuff. I'm not going to because I need something for me to do. Yeah. Otherwise I'm going to burn, right? Like you burn I think it's a, it's a major issue. Right, like uh, for the first 
three to four years of casting, I only focused on casting. Like my everything I did was about how can I build my brand, how can I maybe be better, and it it wasn't. I didn't notice it. It wasn't like a I need to be the best caster ever, although that was sometimes in my mind. It was just a, what do I do with my free time? Well, I play League of Legends, or I watch League of Legends, or I talk about League of Legends, right? Um, and it really led to a quite, quite severe burnout in 2022. Yeah. I missed all of Worlds that year. I started seeing a therapist, which is incredibly helpful. Highly recommend it to everyone. Yes. Um, but yeah, it was, it was bad. And I think if you are going to turn your passion into your job, you need to find what your new passion is and what the, what you can you need to have an outlet. Yeah. Yeah. Like people are like, Oh man, you might play so much magic. I'm like, no dude, I think about magic all the time to talk about it and help, you know, do all this other stuff. But when I want to relax, I'm playing vampire survivors or like yep, civilization choice. or something like something that is so drastically different because yeah. If I'm playing magic in my free time, that's more work. <laughs> yeah, I play magic as yeah. my free time. Right? So, like, it's, like, it's nothing to do with League. We so should actually nice. talk about that because this is technically a magic podcast. Oh, and people get grumpy if I don't mention magic at least somewhere. Um, so how did you find magic? Uh, university again. I was living in a, uh, like a house with three or four other people. And one of them just was like, hey, do you want to play magic with us? And I was like, sure. So I built a... Um, death right shaman like a kitchen table death right shaman deck it wasn't like standard it was just cobbled together from random stuff that these car dialing around yeah you know it was just there yeah uh, i built that and then um played with them for a while i also built a is it carrier door ghost chieftain yes charador yeah but it, it was the first time i'd ever built like a full deck by myself and it was an edh deck and it was diabolically bad like, I, it didn't, I, I, maybe I was just really bad, but it didn't do any of the things I wanted it to do. Obviously, fast mana was a little harder to get in yeah. those days. So I, the first five or six turns, I was just like, And Caradon costs nothing. like seven, so it doesn't yeah, do anything for really a long expensive. time. Yeah, um, really Yeah, I was I, I do nothing, I do nothing, and then everyone else would win. And I didn't really understand what their cards do. I still don't most of the time, but just that, okay, I've lost the game. Cool. Um, Great. Love and that. then yeah then i got a little bit more serious and played some um mono blue uh, so i went to my first pre-release which was i want to say it was gate crash and i played simic i got a prime speaker zagana and i like i was like oh my goodness right, this is great i love simic it's the best i went zero three in that pre-release obviously because that's, that's what you do i remember losing to a a 12 year old boy and it that at the time, like I was like, I, you know, very hyper competitive, very, like very much, I need to be good at things. And it really hurt me, but it, like, it obviously wasn't the guy, like the boy's fault. Right? I was just really annoyed that I wasn't good enough to beat this kid. Um, sure. But yeah, so yeah, I, I went to my first pre-release and then I built a mono blue tempo deck, uh, standard with, um, master of waves and Thassa. And I remember, yeah, so I, I built it and then I saw people playing it. And I remember, I can't remember the exact name of the card, but I included this 1-1 one, one flyer for a better tempo. And I can't, you sacked it to do a thing. Can't remember what it was. But the all the lists I looked on online didn't do, didn't have that flyer in. I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong in including this flyer. But then someone won a competition huh. and their deck list had the flyer in it. And I was like, yes, Justified. I understand magic. <laughs> I've, I've, I've overcome. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Man, that mono blue devotion deck too was hella good. Yeah, it, oh, it was it so was good. Incredibly powerful. Um, yeah, it was so quick as well. Yeah, because I remember, like, I remember that pre-release because I would. That was one of the first pre-releases that I was like competent to go to, mm. like, because I had played Magic from the very dawn of time, but it was just like casually, and then going to like when I came back for real. During Innistrad, I didn't know what I was doing. And then Gate Crash and stuff, I knew. But I got, like, in my pre-release, I got a card called Assemble the Legions, which puts out a 1-1 yes. soldier geometrically. 1-1-2-2-3-3. One. One, one, two, yeah. two, three. It's super good. And I was like, hell yeah, I'm building my deck around this. It's going to be awesome. The dude I played dropped a black enchantment, which says all creatures get minus one, minus one. So my soldier <laughs> would walk out the door and die. <laughs> And I was like, like lemmings. what the hell? Man? <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. It, was, it. it was so bad. Yeah, that was a that was a fun pre-release. Oh yeah, I really enjoyed that pre-release. That set I've only was ever been good. to two now. But... You've only been to two pre-releases. Well, yeah. So I kind of fell off Magic for a while until I um until probably two years ago when Dracos was like, "Hey, Medic, you used to play Magic. Let's play some EDH." And then we just all started playing again. So I only went I went to that one 
and then university and you know stuff got in yeah. the way it just wasn't a priority and then i went to the bloomborough pre-pre-release <laughs> here in berlin which was great fun. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed Bloomborough Sealed, actually. Bloomborough um, Sealed is delightful. I love yeah. it a lot. I mean, obviously the set is gorgeous. It's like stunningly beautiful top to bottom, but it's also just really fun and very yeah. easy to build a deck when you don't know what the cards do. You're like, here's all the raccoons, let's go. Yep. <laughs> does, does it say the same creature type on it? Yeah, cool. That's going in. Um, I, I, see what it, I will say the Sealed is kind of if you get really good synergies, because uh, you can be get between like six and 18 rares, I think, in six packs, right? Yeah. So if you just get a bunch of rares and synergies, um, maybe it's a bit imbalanced, but I'm not experienced enough on Limited to know that, right? I just like to play my rabbits and put them on the battlefield, and then, you know, here, yeah, I here's, mean, like, here's my rabbits. <laughs> I had a black green squirrel deck, and I got the Yigro, the thing that turned all the things into food yeah. and everything. Turns out that card is insane. And yeah, very, really very busted. powerful. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to build an EDH deck around one because I, I cracked one in mine as well. So I went, I, uh, what did I go in the end? I went frogs with Igra top end. So like splash of black. Dude, I had yeah. a 45, 45 Igra at one point. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is bad. <laughs> this is like, but it dies hard. to removal. Yeah, that's Shiver. exactly it. It, it, just, di it just remove it. <laughs> yeah, it just dies to like anything, man. You only have to sack a food and everything's food. So. <laughs> you, every creature you've got is food. It's fine. Just yeah. throw one of them away. You won't mind. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, uh, just quickly. The pre pre release was like German influencers. And I'm very fortunate that the Wizards of the Coast like marketing team put me in the LEC casters in that group. But I played against, uh, I can't remember his name, P Peter. And he was like, oh, yeah, I haven't played in a while. I mostly do D&D &D YouTube stuff. And then I was talking to him after he destroyed me 2-0 in our games. And he said, yeah, so I did used to be a German national champion. <laughs> I was like, what? 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 Oh gosh, yeah. you're dead. <laughs> and then I mat matched up into Toffle in the second round. Oh, okay, like, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, this, this is great. This is very balanced. Very yeah. fair on me. It turns out Toffle is also just one of the best players in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? he's, mm -hmm. I mean, he's won a PT, which is just yeah. like, there are not many people who have done that. And yeah. uh, God, he's also such a lovely guy, man. He's so oh, he's kind. an amazing guy. Yeah. yeah like, they, um, they had me on card market last year. Uh, or year before actually and it was just they're all such welcoming people but even like Toffle now if we're playing EDH I'll message him he even built EDH decks because he didn't have them because <laughs> it just wasn't his format yeah and it's like oh do you want to come over and play some EDH uh, or commander now <laughs> so I keep saying EDH look um, it's 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 always going to be EDH to us we don't have yeah. to follow the copyright restrictions that Wizards does right like true. the reason they call it commander is because Highlander is a tv show Oh, true. Yeah, okay. And that so, like, sense. you can't call it Elder Dragon Highlander because the whole point is there could be only one, right? But if you call it Highlander, uh, you get copyright infringement and sued. And they're like, what if yeah. we just call it Commander instead? Yeah. We have that with, um, we had the Rumble stage at MSI, uh, and we weren't allowed to say, let's get ready to Rumble. Oh, no, because it's a copyrighted WWF. phrase. Even if you speak it, it's like, you cannot say that WWE will get very mad at you. And they have a lot of money and lawyers. Soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, what's it been like coming back to Magic for you? Because I know you've been like posting about it randomly, like, hey, who? Because I, I mean, I learned about you like six months ago because you're like, hey guys, uh, who plays Magic? <laughs> and a bunch yeah, of people were like, you um, need to talk to this guy. <laughs> yeah, like I really enjoy it. I, it's, I think it's for me just a very easy way to disconnect. Yes. Uh, like we it, with we all have enough decks that every play session is different, and it's. Spending time with people I really enjoy spending time with outside of talking about League of Legends. Right. And still, like, at the start of it, when we all get in there, we'll all have our complaint and our mope, and we'll be like, oh, I can't believe I have to work tomorrow, or whatever. But then you have, like, five or six hours, usually, of just, how does this interaction work? How Who are you going to kill? Politicking and everything. Um, I've actually stepped much more into the politicky side of Commander than I thought I would. <laughs> after I started playing Mrs. Bumbleflower, I'm pure politics. That I'm just like, I don't care so if good. I win. I just want to like I want to cast my spells. I want you to draw a card and not attack me, and then I want to enchant you with a whatever the <laughs> one that gives me a gold if someone attacks you. The you curse know. is, uh, uh, yeah. Is it curse of opulence? Curse yes. of opulence. Yeah, it's a card I think that's so good. red, which might not be in. Yeah, that's not in Bubble Flower. I'm thinking of the other one that gives his creatures plus 
Yeah, one, one we call that guy us. Brody Todd, the unluckiest planeswalker, because he just looks like okay. a big old Chad, and he's got every <laughs> picture of him is just him doing some really absurd thing with a bunch of people getting pissed off. But it's like <laughs> one of my favorite just mini cycles of this guy's just misery. Um, oh, cool. But yeah, so group hug decks are super fun to play. You just have to be careful not to like really irritate your friends. Yeah. But there's there's something about just everybody gets a card, and suddenly you're like, oh. But you get more cards. Than I do. You. Yeah, it's, it's fine. fine. You all got fine. cards. Here, you said you wouldn't attack me. Holding people to promises they made like th five game actions ago <laughs> is really fun to me. It's like I have I have twelve cards in hand, but you promised you weren't going to make me discard any, and I have this Triska Decker file on the on the I'm battlefield. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like... But yeah, and plus Bumbleflower is like also just such a beautifully drawn card. Oh, I don't know, it's something very pretty. Bloomboro is maybe the best looking magic set ever. Yeah, it's kind of just bizarre. Like, I don't know how it took them this long to get around to like, what if small animals? But uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad they did. Yeah, I think it's the the earnestness of it that really gets to me. There's no like that. Obviously, there are looming threats. Yeah. right? But most of the cards are just little creatures being little creatures. Right. And the tre I think the treasure token is actually the best example. The of family. I remember. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I, I read. Um, it was a tweet or something by the person that had drawn it saying. I wanted to remind people that treasure isn't only gold. And I think that's just Bloomberg as a set, you know? Wanted to remind you that there is beauty in the world. Yeah. And then we're going to go to Duskmorn and see that there's scary things in the world as well. You know? I, every time Wati, Wati does it all the time, they're like, here's a happy glowing set. The next set is just about like the utter desolation of humanity. It's like, come <laughs> yeah. on, man. Let me have I kind of wish we'd had more of a cycle of Bloomborough. Like, I would have liked a, like the old school, you know, right? the, three, the block. A three release block. Yeah. yeah. Or even just one more set. Just give yeah. us one more set to just kind of... But they're like, oh, we want to have Dustborn for Halloween. I'm like, you could dress up the animals in cute little costumes. And oh, have pumpkins. Yeah. That would have been adorable. Pumpkin. Oh. oh. Come on, man. Pumpkin food. It would have been so good. A, a Halloween themed Bloomboro would, would have been amazing. Like a, a cat in a little witch's hat? Right! Oh. Like oh. a little raccoon with a ghost hood. It would have been so oh. cute. Oh my god. A man okay. now. Like, it's, it's Sharpie magic with the Bloomboro set. Ah, and we just have to draw ah, on. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> oh my god. Um, it's boom. Boom. Get out. <laughs> 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 Man, that's awesome. So, I'm, I mean, I love when people come back to Magic. It's just like chill time. Like, mm -hmm. this again doesn't have to be as hardcore as we make it. It doesn't have to be like so all consuming. You can also just be like, hey, I'm here to hang out with my friends. Like, one of my big philosophies as a member of the CAG and everything is that, like, I, I speak for like a lot of the kitchen table players and the folks who are just like, I buy one pack a quarter and just throw it into my deck that I've got sitting yeah. around. Or I buy a box during pre-release and then my friends and I draft it and that's it for like a year or whatever it is, right? Like, because so many of the highest invested players, like you should be focusing on us and making the band list work for us. And this, I'm like, yeah, yeah but there's like, you are like 0.1% of the player base. Yeah. And I want to make sure those guys are also having fun. So I'm going to aim at that. But then they get very grumpy because you're enough. Well, we're not about me. I don't like this. But I mean, I'm sure it's like that in League too, where like the high end players are just like, how come you guys are just catering to the casual scrubs and not rebalancing everything for me? Like, Yeah, I think one of the good things with League is there's a few more levers to pull on rebalancing. And like, because you can patch a champion, you yes. can't patch a magic card, yeah. really, right? It's out there, it's done. Yeah. Um. So what actually happens even in patch notes now is when a change is enacted, they will have a little symbol next to it to show is this a low level change? Is this an elite level change? Is this a mid level change? And like people are a bit happier generally because they can see who that who the change mm. is aimed at. Do and they ever do things where like a, a champion is just completely like rewritten? Yeah, all the time. Like uh, there's one champ called Rise who's probably been reworked six times and never Jeez. never falls into a good spot. But um, it's it like probably once or twice a year there'll be like a big. Re rework of a champion and often it's because the mechanics are old or it doesn't fit into the current league philosophy so something that's happened a lot over the years is movement speed creep so people have more dashes and they're just quicker generally and it's like well if your only ability to get onto someone is this slow moving projectile it's like well everyone can just move out of the way so we need to adjust you right Same. um 
but we do have a lot of like the higher end streamers who get you know a few thousand people watching them when they complain it's it's a really interesting thing because it's like i'm relatively good at league i'm like top 0.2 percent of the player base right master master plus and i'll see these people complain in challenger which is the top 200 players on the server and then i'll see someone who's a silver player be like echoing the same complaint yeah. about like how red side is really favored in draft and it's like it doesn't matter to you like it, it almost feels like you're, you're just, echoing some sort of like the the wealth tax it's like oh yeah. well i i make 50k but the people making 100k say it's 100 million uh, say it's bad so i'm gonna right? say it's bad you know? oh my god it happens yeah. It happens all the time. Some prominent creator will say something, and then suddenly people will start peppering you with questions like, why haven't you banned this specific scenario from happening? I'm like, buddy, if you're in the pro tour and this yeah. happens, okay, that's a problem. But it's not a problem for you. I assure you it's not. And like, you're not playing at the level or tier that this is going to affect you. You're just mad because somebody told you to be mad. Yeah. And like, that happens in politics. That happens in... Mm. Uh, you know, culture and everything. religion in yeah. every in every facet of everything. Somebody told you to be mad, and you're like, "That sounds reasonable." And that's like, okay. Yeah. And often, often it is reasonable at the sure. level of the person, right? Sometimes right. the complaints are spurious, and it's just they're mad because they've lost five games in a row, or right? Something. But often it is a reasonable complaint and can be worked on. Sure. But there's just always it, it, the voice becomes so much larger and so much more frustrating. And we've like I've had it a lot with casting as well, where. Uh, a high tier co streamer will be like, oh, Medic's point was really bad. And then not listen to like me clarifying the point or something. And uh, you'll get like 10 messages on Twitter or something. Being, people are like, why, why would you say such for something so idiotic? And did you like, see the sentence that followed it? Yeah, did, did you pay any attention to the context? But because this one person's mad, like their fans become oh, yeah. mad. And it gets very frustrating. I think my favorite is like when people will reply to a tweet I make and they're like, how dare you say the thing, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, did you see the exact next tweet I made that is in that chain that you're replying to? <laughs> it's like... Yeah. Context is king, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right? It's just, yeah. yeah it just, like, it's, it's wild because like in magic, we have so many different invisible factors we have to pay attention to with like balancing or dealing with community or whatever, just because like there's a statistic what Watsi likes to say, which is like 11 out of every 12 commander players have no visibility within the ecosystem of magic. Mm -hmm. We just know they exist because somebody is buying these cards, they're playing, they're doing this, but they don't go to stores or they don't go to tournaments or they don't go to cons or whatever. And a lot of that, they're like, well, how come you're not doing data driven? To, like, Commander doesn't have data. What yeah. the hell is data? It's, we're four <laughs> people playing a chill multiplayer game. Like, I mean, that would have been me. Uh, until I went to MagicCon Amsterdam, mm. which was incredible. Highly recommend going to MagicCons, by the way, if you yes. get the opportunity. Amsterdam like, was the I, best one by far, too. Yeah. I was buying all my cards online. I was building decks through Architect every now and again, or just like laying out cards in front of me and building the deck. And then I was playing at home. And the only way you have any visibility on that is when I tweet that I've beaten my opponents, right? right. Like, that's it. <laughs> exactly. And then, like, for most people, a tweet is, you know, going out to 10 people or something. Yeah, So exactly. it doesn't actually, like, you have no visibility on it. And you can't just, like, crack into their computer and, like, watch them through their webcam or something while they while they play uh, Scry yeah. Table. Scry exactly table that. Yeah. It, it's, I don't know, it just, what I've learned from being in leadership position over, like, this four years or whatever we've done it, is people have very myopic glare on their situation their mm -hmm. table or their community or their sub reddit or their you know whatever genre they're in but they don't think about it from the level that we have to think about it where it's like a hundred thousand miles up looking down and yeah. that's because that they've got no reason to and they've got no ability to but then they'll complain to us and we'll say like no it's fine for this scheme of things or like we ban a card and they're like that was fine for me and my friend we were totally cool i'm like that's 15 people the other 150,000 people. <laughs> I don't know, but that's weird. But why haven't you banned Nadu, huh? Huh, Shivam? I've never played against it, but people on Twitter were mad, so <laughs> I'm mad as well. <laughs> you know, the, the, the irony is by the time this show comes out, Nadu may or may not have been banned. I just don't know what they're going to do yep. yet. But, like, real talk is, like, for that, the, the expectation is if you're a high-level player and you're playing Nadu, great. Your table knows how to deal with it. Who cares? If you're an average player, you're going to play that deck once or twice. You're going to be like, there's a lot of actions and card manipulation, and this is boring. And then you're going to stop. Yeah. It happens every time. There's always going to be some crazy commander like Turgrid or Tautril or something just like Chulain. They're like, huh, this card just vomits cards out. That was 
fun, but my friends didn't like it and it wasn't very satisfying. So yeah. we're going to take the tank part. Yeah. I have an Anya Falconworth deck I built, which uh, wins off World Gorger Dragon uh, and some sort of X cost burn spell, right? <laughs> so it's World Gorger Dragon Graveyard, uh, reanimate, and then you just cycle through your whole deck to get an X, X cost burn spell. I played it twice because both times I played it, I did the combo, I won the game and realized it wasn't fun to do that with my friends, right? It's just not enjoyable. It's like, what's the point, right? And Nardu feels very similar. It's like, you can take as many game actions as you want, but is it fun to re-equip Shunko, play a land, re-equip, you know? And just because when your turn takes like 35 minutes and it's indeterminate, you're not necessarily going to win. If you can sit there and say like, look, if I do these four actions, the game is going to be over. Yeah, if you can present a lethal right. combo, then it's But fun. otherwise, if you're just going to be dirtling and going through your deck and dirtling and going through your deck, I'm like, I'm going to pull out my cell phone or I'm going to start playing Pokemon Go or I'm going to be doing anything. And like when your table disengages, that's when there's a problem. Yeah. And that's one of the big considerations. If Nadu gets banned, that's going to be why because he was indeterminately long. It's super annoying to everybody. Um, yeah. It is interesting to balance around kitchen tables because like every, I think every commander group has a rule zero conversation. And I actually saw a, a few posts on Twitter about this saying, maybe there shouldn't be a rule zero conversation. Why do you need to have it? And it's like, well, the expectation in any social situation is you have a rule zero conversation, even if it's not like- And it's not even a rule, yet. you're just talking, hey, what deck are yeah. you playing? There's your rule zero conversation. Yeah, what level? Yeah. Like, uh, do I bring my pre-con or do I bring my slivers? Are we going to play know? fast uh, or like, slow? What's going to happen, right? Exactly, right? Um, and I think- that is what the joy of Commander is to me as well. Because we've introduced two new people recently. And we had a, um, one of my co-casters called Aragon. And he's never played Magic before. And the whole thing was like, I'm only going to play lands until Aragon takes a game action. And then when he takes a game action, I'll take a game action. And I will just like, I'm not going to try and flood the board. I'm not going to try. I just want to have fun with my mates, right? And yeah. he's going to be really confused. And that's cool. But That's awesome. Uh, I love that. Yeah, it, I think the the idea of Commander being this thing that really needs to be finely honed and tuned, you can do that if you want, but I don't think there should be an overarching body trying to tr like finely hone and tune Look, it for us. If we balance the way the tournament players want to, we would have to ban like 60 to 100 cards. We would yeah. have to have a lot of rules changes. We would have to like, you know, partners couldn't exist or whatever. And it's like, Commander is meant to be a chill, fun time. If you want to turn it into something competitive, we're not going to stop you. That's yeah. fine. CEDH You're, exists. Do right? what you, you can want. be yeah. super competitive with yeah, it. Yeah, like who cares, man? Like, like we're not going to Kool-Aid man through your house and tell you how to play the game. But we're not directing our resources to build the game to make that easy because that's not what we want. We want yeah. folks who just hang out at their buddy's house and play Commander to have a good time. And sometimes they're just cards that are incompatible with that. Yeah. And that's what banning is. Like, there's a card called Limited Resources. Have you ever heard of this card? Uh, no. Yeah, you probably haven't because it's old and it was never reprinted. Let me, let me, I'm going to read it to you because this is a miserable card. Is it legal? No. Ah, sad. I, I was just going to crack it out in my next game night. Yeah. yeah, no, this came out in Exodus, so in like 1998 or something. Okay. And basically what it is, it's a one mana enchantment, a one white mana enchantment that says when it enters, each player chooses five lands they control and sacrifices the rest. Players cannot play lands as long as 10 or more lands are on the battlefield. People have been yeah, begging. Yeah, that just sounds, that yeah. sounds awful. People are telling me that that's fine. You should unban this card. I'm like, if you're playing a four-player game and only 10 lands are allowed and you drop this, it's a one white mana casting cost. You can literally get to five lands before anybody else does and lo lock the table up. Yeah. That's just, I th I th yeah, sorry. That's incompatible with multiplayer. Yep, I agree. And, and I think miserable. <laughs> if you want to play that card, Get three other people that say, hey, that's cool. We can play around it and just play. The ban list, it, like, in the end, for anything you play at your kitchen table, the ban list is a suggestion. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. Just don't be a poo-poo brain to people in a scenario that isn't people that you've already had this conversation with, you know? I appreciate you saying this because this is literally what I say all the time. <laughs> so it makes yeah. me happy that somebody else is also... Uh, I mean, it's, it's the same. Like if I played, I, sometimes I play five man, just flex games with my yeah. friends, right? And if I, I'm a support main, if I want to play Jungle Teemo, I don't go in and just say, hey guys, I'm locking Jungle Teemo, good luck, right? Because that it's not a traditional jungle pick, just as a, you wouldn't sure. usually do that, right? I, I go to them and say, hey guys, I want to try out Jungle Teemo. Everyone cool with that? They say no. I'm like, okay, well then I'm probably not going to play Jungle Teemo because my friends don't want me to do it. Right. 
right? It, it's such exactly an easy that. conversation to have. Yeah, it's like my friend's like, hey, do you mind that I have this theme deck and I've got a plane talker leading it? It's like, sure. Yeah. And if I'm not, like, you know, that's not the game I want to play right now. Okay, fine. Like NBD. Yeah. It's totally cool. And then people are like, well, then why do we need you? It's like, you don't. <laughs> But we're here to just give a baseline. Yeah. That's all. It's advisory. Advisory. Okay. Yeah. So can I ask you a couple of lead questions? No. Yeah. Of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Fine. No. No. It's okay. a magic podcast. Yeah. Um, okay. So like you just said, like you picked a creature that's not a jungler, but it's how do you know what role a character is meant to be or a champion is meant to be in? Uh, so most of the champions, when they're released, are released with a primary role and a secondary role. Now you can technically play any champion in any like, role. Because like role, it, like role is just—it's not like a, a hard and fast thing, right? It's like it's just you, when you know you're playing a top laner, you just stick to that. But nothing is yeah. forcing you to do that, right? Uh, well, so in ranked, you you deliberately queue up for a position, right? So top, mid, jungle, support, or AD. Um, or bot lane, technically, for the last one. Um, so if you are going outside of that when you're playing ranked, it's widely seen as you're not playing the game optimally, so you you could be banned for doing that. There are certain strategies where you can mess around with it, but widely but the community will say, actually, you're not trying to play optimally, and this is a ranked environment, so you shouldn't do that. Sure. Right? But they, like the rules of the game don't force you to do that. No. No, you can... You can go anywhere you want yeah, on the just, map. I mean, right? it, obviously, but you're not going to if you're playing at a top tier level. It's like, yeah, exactly. You're not right. going to bring um, a clown deck to a pro tour. Come on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so most of the champions that fit into certain roles will have certain abilities. So for a support, often you'll either want a heal or a shield or some sort of crowd control, like a stun or a dash in like a hook or something. Eight, uh, bot laners tend to be based around lots of fast auto attacks. So you want things that speed up your auto attacks or give you a bit of uh, safety. Uh, mid laners tend to be mages. Well, that's the easiest way to define it. It gets a lot more complicated like below that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, junglers tend to either be really high damage or tanks. So it's like, can you come into a lane? So the jungler gets to roam around the whole map. Yeah. So it's like, can you like join a lane team. and do some crowd control or can you just kill someone immediately? And then top laners are either like bruisers, so tanky boys that do damage, or just tanks most of the time. Is there like a real fundamental difference between like top lane and bottom lane or something like that? It's like... Yeah. Well, I mean, hmm. there are some minor differences that are probably too convoluted to get into sure. on the, this level of uh, podcast. But the, <laughs> the major difference is top lane is an isolated lane. Deep. So usually it's a 1v1. And then bot lane is usually a 2v2. And what the support does in the 2v2 role is they won't be getting any of the extra resources, but they're there to protect the AD carry. Uh, and it, uh, I was trying to think of a magic analogy, but I don't know enough about magic to get a good analogy. It's off fine. It, they're, they're just there to make sure the AD carry can get gold, because if the AD carry gets lots of items, they become really strong. Whereas top laners are more like two beefy dudes hitting each other in the head and seeing who wins. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I like, I look at Lee, I'm like, oh yeah, there's like random NPCs to kill. And then like, you have to go and destroy the tower on the other side. But it's, I'm, every time I try, I get like match up with random Koreans who just wipe the floor at me. And then it's like, yeah. okay, but that. I think the, the new player experience is quite bad, although it has got a lot better recently. Um, they recently released a, an article saying they've reduced the amount of bots in a game from one every 20 games to one every 200 games. Because people used to just use bots to level up and then they'd get the account at level 30 when you can play ranked and sell it to someone. Um, but because they've reduced that, it makes it a lot easier for new players to play because it's not just a bot in all of your games. Right? right. Yeah. Oh, man. So when you cast a League of Legends game, uh, actually, you know what, man? We're like at an hour. I'm not going to start on like asking about like, what okay. it's like to actually cast these things but um i presume you have to like sit and actually do a lot of work beforehand and study the different like is there a meta for like uh who is a good champion for any season or anything like that yeah usually um every, every two weeks there's a patch but usually over a two-month period you'll have the same five to ten champions per role so i'll understand those quite in depth and then i play a lot of the game as well like usually my work week is about 60 hours at the moment of like playing and studying and then and like shows are 10 hours each on the right. weekend, right? Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, most of the time my research is done. I don't actually do much champion research because I know them all by now. Sure. Most of my research is like player research and stats research. So I'll, I'll know how much time a jungler spends around his mid lane or how much time he goes to top lane, how many times he counter jungles per game. Like, and like, all of so these you can things. also get like the story to tell beyond just... Exactly, like, right. Yeah. And even just like historical stuff, like how many times have these two players matched against each other? Oh, What's good. the record? Like that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that that's like one of the things that fascinates me about casting is just the, the artistry of like filling, like when I watch a lot of baseball and listening to baseball uh, casters is like phenomenal because there's a lot of dead time in baseball. So they have to fill in with like, this is the third time in 400 years that somebody has hit this ball to the left two yeah. degrees or whatever. You're like, how do you have this statistic? Why? But it's like, well, you have hours to fill. And yeah. like... I mean, in Magic, at least, so you, you play a card, you do that, and then sometimes you're like, okay, well, I've got to tell a story because this guy's just going to be in his head for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But League is a very I, fast game where you have time to do that. Yeah, I think the one of the things I really like about Magic um, and the broadcast at the moment is the the sped up games and the, the removing the breaks. I think it really helps the casters because for a while you sat in a position where it's like, I can see he has lethal. He knows he has lethal, but he has to work out every permu permutation to make sure that lethal is actually going to happen. But, I mean, also, some of the, my favorite magic moments, like the lightning helix. Like, you, getting moments like that, you don't get that as much in League. You can have surprise moments, but you don't just get this, everything rides on the top what this deck. card is, yeah. right? Oh, it was so incredible. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I think I think the sort of the filling the dead space. We have a little bit of it. Some games can be slow. You know, five kills in twenty minutes is is not a lot of action. No, and you fill it with like stories about the players, or sometimes you just riff. Like Vedi and I, my my most common co-caster, we've been casting together for six years. Oh, then so you already we'll have chemistry. Like, so you know. Yeah, each other. we'll just talk about like Smash Bros. or <laughs> something we've seen on TikTok recently, or you know, just make up names for stuff. Right. Um, well, I mean, th that's the that's the joy of a good partnership. Like when yeah. these two people have like chemists, like, like for instance, in Magic, when Marshall and Louise sit down to do any casting oh. together, it is phenomenal because they know each other intimately well and they can riff and bounce and just tell a really cool story. Or like uh, Cedric and Patrick Sullivan, which you might have not seen because they used to do Star City coverage. But even no, I, and, I listened to them as well. Yeah. Were, yeah. Just genius, too. Like they're so good at just when there's a long, boring stretch, there's an interesting story happening, anyways. And yeah. they're, they're like, I've tried casting and I have a lot of respect for casters because because I'm good at talking, but I'm I don't know. It's hard to talk and also pay attention to the game at the same time. That's like yeah. that is an art form because you have to keep your eye. I think on you that. also like you are very entertaining to listen to, but you can't trust that the story is going to go one way. Right. And I think as a caster, you need to be able to see the through line when you start. Um, and that's like no again, like no insult or anything. I love the way you tell stories, but often they will like yeah, bounce well, around that, a few different I, places. I know so. where my skill set is, and it is not in being the narrative caster for a, a game. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, some one of the overlooked parts of casting is understanding when you start where you're going to end. Yes, and it, how yes. things change depending on how the game changes. Yes. Right? Um, so like we'll go into a cast and we'll have like three or four storylines. Like this is what we want to talk about, but being able to like flick on the fly to something else and understanding how you get there it is a real talent because otherwise it sounds super janky it'll be like you've only talked about top lane the whole time and like actually mid lane's important cool and that like that can be funny if you do it like that but also it can feel very jarring to the viewer if you've been talking about like only talking about thought seeds for the entire game yes and then you talk about demonic consultation it's like why are we you know. <laughs> yeah, that's a really. I just picked two random. Yeah, magic I know. They're both black, so it kind of works. What right? is the situation where demonic consultation and thought seize? Well, maybe work? he was going to thought seize the demonic consultation out of his hand to stop the Thassa. Someday Oracle, you know? they will yeah. make a multiplayer discard spell, and it's going to be a terrible day because it's going to. Oh, be, good. Uh, it's going to be uh, miserable. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, man. Gosh, no, but you were exactly right, though, and. uh Oh, I had a thought and it vaporized. That's okay. You know what? Um, I think this has been a lovely chat and I really appreciate you coming on with me. Oh, that's what it was. As, an, as a viewer who is not versed in League of Legends, one thing I find challenging is watching League of Legends casting and trying to understand at all what's happening. And I realize I am not the audience. You guys have to cast to an audience of people who know. And Magic has that same problem where it's very hard if you're a new player to watch a stream and be like, what the hell is even happening? 
But I don't know the solution to that. Like, how do people get into this without knowing league? And I think that's a, just a fundamental esports problem, right? Like, yeah. if you don't know the game, you're just, unless it's Street Fighter or like a shooting game like Quake or something, yeah. it's hard to tell right. what's C happening. CSGO is the easiest esports to watch. Yes. Yeah. Gun go pew, man die. Right. right. Like, it's so simple. And Rocket League is in a very similar boat. Um, I think the best thing that I found in Magic is overlays. Like people use it on Arena, the yeah. is it untapped or something. Yeah. I don't mean to like call yeah, yeah. out specific right. brands, but um, the ability to hover over cards and just sit there and read them and try and process yes. is really good. I'm I also a big think fan of that. beginner streams. I've I've tried to champion this for such a long time. Like having a stream that just tells you for League, this is uh, the the basics of stuff. Like just this is why they're killing minions. This is why this jungler is doing this. I this is what this item does. I, I, like, you can't do that on a main broadcast because we're appealing to, say, golden above players most of the time. Right, Every now the and dedicated again, viewer, be, right? Exactly, right? And that's like 50% of our player base. So it's still a lot of people. Um, but I can't sit there and tell you why you would use your flash in this position. I just have to be like, he's flash! Duh, right. duh, duh, duh. Right. So, yeah, yeah that, that's a challenge that Magic faces a lot. And every now and then I want... I, I entertain the thought of like, what if I just took an old pro tour and sat down and took a game and just broke it down for a new player to say like, this is what happened and this is why it mattered. Yeah. And I, maybe I still will actually. That might be a really interesting piece of content. I, I'd be I'd be really interested if you ever do something like that <laughs> in doing it with you. If yeah. you ever want to do so, or even like I I don't know what Watsi's views are on co-streamers and such, but they, having they a co-streamer for well yeah. then having a co-stream for like a pro tour and just being like, hey guys. We will talk about some of the complex interactions, but actually most of this is going to be a, what does this card do? Why is it good? How does this work? That would be really fun, actually. That would be yeah, really would. fun. We might have to have a conversation later. Yeah, um, always happy to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but with that, my friend, this has been a lovely chat, and thank you so much for joining me. I'm really glad that we were able to make this work. I know time zones are very difficult. Uh, and you're based in Berlin, of all places, uh, after all this long journey. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> uh, but cool, man. So if folks wanted to find you or yourself or you're casting yourself, where could they go? Uh, I'm at Medicasts on all platforms. So Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, I think. I don't really do YouTube, <laughs> uh, Instagram. So yeah, I'm I'm always around. And if you want to watch League of Legends, you can find it on the internet. <laughs> Just type in League of Legends esports, something will come up. Yeah, it's I'm literally sure. the easiest thing in the world to find, let me tell yeah. you. Um, and as always, my friends, you can find me at Gear Pre Gears. You can find this podcast in our podcaster sold or at YouTube every Tuesday. Thanks to my editor, Dan. And you can find me on Shiva and Wheeler Love Magic, where we sit and talk about every single set in the history of magic. One card at a time for many, many hours at a time. It's a good podcast. Oh, I like. I love listening to it. It's so much fun to do. And also my Dragonlance podcast, Chronicles of Dragonlance, where me and my buddy are sitting, going chapter by chapter through the original Dragonlance novels, just because it's fun to talk about and I like to send my own voice. Uh, <laughs> but with that, my friends, remember, it's not magic without the gathering, and we'll see you next time.